Hi, Deanna. Thanks for being here today. Hi, Lisa. So great to see you. Yeah, we go back a ways. You yeah, in Taiwan Radio, too. Yes. And you were on my radio show a long time ago, but you haven't been on my TV show. And I think your story and you showing up with the smile that you have on your face is a great lesson for people who are watching. So thanks for agreeing to be on the show. I know it takes a lot of your energy. Uh, we will be talking about your chronic illness and uh, the many, many years you've been coping with it. So again, thanks for being here. Great. Thank you for having me. I work in the patient advocacy space a lot of the time, keynotes I give, and uh, I built an online course for patients and caregivers. My mom was misdiagnosed and nearly died because of it. And so having you on to talk about you living with a seven, seven years of misdiagnosis mm -hmm. and having um, not one, but two misdiagnoses. And, yeah. uh, and finally, now you know exactly what's wrong, but let's just start from the beginning for people who are not familiar with your story um, and just how your symptoms came on and what your life was like before this happened. And just we'll get to where you are now, but let's start from the beginning. Sure. Well, it's it goes back to 2006. So I just had my 18th anniversary with longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. And uh, when I was diagnosed, um, before, I should kind of show you that before I was diagnosed, I was very active. I worked for Nova Nordisk as a diabetes care specialist. So I was always traveling, always on the road. Um, I would ski, mountain bike, softball. Those were my passions um, outside of work. And it all started one morning. Uh, I went to take a hot bath and I stuck my left leg in and it was cold, ice cold. And uh, I thought that was odd. And then I was rather annoyed because I was thinking the water heater is on the frit and I might have to get a new one. And then I reached down with my left hand and it was scalding hot. So there was something wrong with my leg and I didn't know what. So I knew something was going on, but I wasn't sure what. Um, I decided to continue with my day. I went to Starbucks. And by the time I drove to Starbucks, I had trouble controlling my arms and my leg. And I looked like a complete mess going into Starbucks to try and get an order for coffee. And I knew everyone was looking at me and I just burst into tears. I knew something was deeply wrong. I just didn't know what. So you're, so you're having these symptoms and, you know, what makes you feel the water and think, I guess you think I'll deal with this later. It's probably just yeah. a kind of a weird offset thing yeah so then when this happens now and you and you you have I'm sure a bit of a panic about it then you're then you're thinking 911 you know I wasn't thinking 911 uh originally I was gonna go to my brother's house but I didn't want to scare my nephews because they were five at the time so I ended up calling my mom who's an old nurse and that she lived seven hours away and I told her what was going on. And she goes, I'll be right there. She drove seven hours, came straight over. And she said, you have two choices. We're either gonna take an ambulance to the hospital or I'm driving you to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So we drove to the hospital and in a matter of uh, hours, days, I became paralyzed up to my earlobe while they were trying to find a diagnosis. Now, what's really interesting is my brother, who should have been a doctor, diagnosed me correctly from the onset. He said, just based on my Google and your symptoms, it says transverse myelitis. And it's known as an evil cousin to MS. That's the best way I would describe it. It's very rare. Only 1,400 people in the U.S. get it. Um, so it's, it's very rare and a cousin to MS. And so the doctors immediately said MS. In fact, uh, one of the doctors came to me and it was as if he was telling me that someone died. He just grabbed my hand and he goes, I'm so sorry to tell you this, but you have MS. And I was just like, just it rocked my world because I thought of uh, Richard Pryor. I saw that other Annette Budicello. 
uh, other people who were celebrities who had MS and how devastating that a picture. You're only seeing little flashes of their life, you know, yeah. in that picture. You're not seeing, you know, what they live with every day. No. And what no. that really looks like. Um, mm -hmm. And that can be for the better or the, wor or the worse, right? Yeah. You're not seeing how people can still have quality of life or you're not seeing how people deal with it day to day in a difficult way. Yeah. Yeah. That's very true. So you were diagnosed, misdiagnosed with MS and you had a second misdiagnosis after that. Yes. I was misdiagnosed with MS for seven years. And then I was misdiagnosed with neuromyelitis optica, uh, which is another rare cousin to MS. Uh, basically the differentiating factors of NMO versus MS or transverse myelitis is that it affects your op um, optic uh, nerve as well as your brain and your spinal cord. Whereas transverse myelitis affects your brain and your spinal cord and MS does affect your brain and spinal cord. So what happens for you to go from that first misdiagnosis to the second misdiagnosis? Why, why was that? Why did that happen? Were they still searching? That, did you have new symptoms? I felt the onset of my symptoms didn't really match up with MS because MS is a slower onset. And mine was just so critical because I was, um, there was a 24 hour period where they didn't even think I was going to make it. Mm -hmm. And so I was uh, paralyzed up to my earlobe. I was barely breathing. And they were basically, uh, <laughs> and this is kind of funny, but they were shooing away priests from my room who wanted to do laps right. And my parents were like, no, not yet. You can't have her yet. Um, so uh, they would shoot the priests out. But yeah, there's a 24-hour period where they didn't think I was even going to make it. And the seriousness of the onset gave me pause compared to my other friends who had MS and their stories, it was much slower. It wasn't as dramatic. Um, and uh, so that's with transverse myelitis. You have all these things happening at once, uh, whereas MS, it, it kind of goes a bit slower. It's not as dramatic. That's an onset is the best way I could describe it. Right, it happens. Um, Let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll talk about your actual diagnosis and that what, what that means to your everyday life, because you talked about being so active, and like I said, you were ginger gun on the radio and yeah. all of the things, and now your life, you you basically are homebound, Yeah, and we're going to talk about what that means for your life, and, and again, how you show up with this great big smile. So we'll be back with uh, more from Deanna in just a moment. We are back with Deanna Kirkpatrick. You and I have been friends for a long time. Uh, I remember hearing about your diagnosis. I remember you nearly not surviving your diagnosis or the misdiagnosis, the onset of your episode of illness. And one of the things when I reached out to you, I said, let's talk about where you are now. And you lived seven years with two different misdiagnoses. And one of the questions I have for you is, you were misdiagnosed with MS and what you call uh, one of its evil cousins. If you had been properly diagnosed from the start, and you said your brother should have been a doctor because he properly diagnosed you from the start, what do you actually have and how did that impact your life to not know seven years sooner what you had? Yeah. Unfortunately, there's no cure for uh, longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. There's no cure. There's no drug to be able to help. Um, well, I should, I should say there's no, uh, like MS has MS drug to help slow down, uh, the progression of MS. Um, they found that with MS drug, it could actually make transverse myelitis worse as in chronic exhaustion, chronic pain. Uh, those because are were taking things. MS medications. Yeah. So that yeah. did affect your quality of life. Yes. I, in fact, if not like you're a non cure, it affects the outcome of your quality. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so it really did affect the out, the, it really did affect um, my quality of life uh, with 
transverse myelitis. And so I wonder, I do, I wonder how my life would be different. It's, it's probably not too different than what it is today. I'm pretty homebound. Um, I used to be really active, ski, mountain bike, play softball before I was diagnosed. And um, I'm pretty much, I spend my days rotating between the bed and the recliner. Um, and and that's, you know, it kind of takes a village to help take care of me. And I have a wonderful village. I'm blessed with amazing family members, friends, neighbors who want to help. And um, so I have I have young men who come in and clean and do my chores around the house. They do my gardening. They do my snow removal. Uh, anything that I need assistance with, they help. Uh, my mom will go shopping for me. I mean, even shopping. Um, I I don't have many good days. Um, so a good day. What does that do? What does a good day look like for you? Going to Safeway and shopping on my own. <laughs> That's a good day for me. So if I'm out of energy, right? Where do you want to yeah. allocate your energy? Yes. Now with this with this diagnosis that you have now, the onset is part of the danger of what you described in that you had, you were paralyzed up almost you know to your ears. You were having trouble breathing. Some people don't survive that onset. Right. And so tell us about that. Like there's a percentage of people who don't survive the onset because of how critically ill you were. Yes. There's other kind of statistics that, that go from there even that are yeah. still, some people remain paralyzed. You did not. Yeah. What, what were those, oh, those factors? I have a friend of mine who is actually paralyzed up to her earlobes and she uses her tongue to type out text messages. Uh, and she is just happy to be alive. She's just like, I'm still happy to be here. You know, it's changed my life dramatically, but she gives me positive inspiration yeah. because I could still walk, but I can only walk short distances now. Um, I could still drive. So that, that's a big thing. Um, but I really do have... Uh, you have to have a good medical team around you. And and to get to my current diagnosis, I went to a neurologist who specializes in transverse myelitis because I just really felt that I didn't quite have MS. And so I went to him, uh, Dr. James Bowen, uh, at Swedish in Seattle, uh, the MS center there. And he did diagnose me with longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. So my scars go from T11 all the way up with C3 and a spot on D2. And so that's why I was having uh, difficulty breathing. Uh, so it is an amazing thing about um, second opinions and being willing to yes. ask questions. You have to follow your gut. You have mm -hmm. to follow your gut. When my mom was sick, it did not make sense. And yeah. I fired her doctor in the hallway. Yeah, I got her moved, and most people don't yeah. realize it's it's a it's a uh, marketplace. Yeah, Maybe no, take care of you, and if they're not giving you the care that you need, you, you wouldn't keep going to the same bad haircut. No, you just no. wouldn't. You know, I I actually went to a top neurologist here in Wenatchee to try and make things easier, and he, when I asked if I could ask for a second opinion, he absolutely just went ballistic yeah. that I would even There's have a lot of ego involved for some physicians a lot I of like ego. Any prevent in, pr uh, profession there are yeah. people who don't want outside influence or things like that and again I mean you have to follow your gut you have yeah. to follow your gut and and if you so have a doctor what's that who, if you have a doctor who prevents you from getting a second opinion get a new doctor absolutely and, you know, there's other things that are come into play, the factors in choosing positions and providers. And I hear a lot about how healthcare just isn't as good as it used to be and these things like that. I I don't have physicians who don't take good care of me yeah. or my family. I yeah. don't because if I did, I'd get a new one. And right. there are enough out there. I mean, I guess it depends if you live in a very rural area and you have limited um, access. But in general, 
Um, and you might have to be willing to get in the car and drive two and a half hours either way if you're in the middle of Washington State. Yeah. You need to get the positions here. But sometimes you have to go somewhere where they see things, specialize in it, and it's a different lens. And that's what some of the doctors I've talked to, the second opinion physician my mom had, was just said, we had to look through a different lens. We had yeah. to look through a different lens. Yeah. And that's what you're looking for is that different lens. Yeah. Let me just look great where I talk. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, I was so grateful to finally get my diagnosis. Yes. I mean, yeah. yes. Because at least then you know you are making informed decisions now for your yeah. life based on all of the information that you have available to you. Yeah. And that feeling of something's not quite right is gone for you. And that allows you to do, you know, work in other areas of your life that take your energy. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take a break. When we come back. We're going to talk about your everyday life now and just also speak to um, what it is for someone who lives with chronic illness. And there is no cure at this point. And so we'll talk about what that means for you. We'll be back in just a moment. We are back talking with Deanna Kirkpatrick, and we have shared your misdiagnoses as well as your correct diagnosis. And you've been dealing with chronic illness for 18 years, yeah. and you are pretty much homebound. You pick and choose how you use your energy. You have help mm -hmm. throughout the house for the needs of, you know, like you said, snow shoveling, gardening, that type of thing. So many times when someone is ill, uh, whether it's a chronic illness or a, a longer illness that, you know, people kind of, people on the outside of your life get back to life. You know, they're supportive right. as they can be. But, right. um, and I find that we are who we are in a crisis times like 10. And I, yeah. would, I would say that's why you have this smile on your face because you are who you are times 10. And times 10 for you is positive, smiling, yeah. trying to look at the best case scenario glass half full sort of thing. Yeah. And there are people who want to support you in that and maybe don't know how, or, yeah. you know, they go on with their lives and you're still someone who is sick. And, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, unless there's a cure found this, this is how you'll live your life. Yeah. So what do you say to the people who have someone in their life who's going through even an acute situation that might be a cancer diagnosis and treatment or, or a long-term or chronic illness? How can they be of support? You know, if you're if you're someone who makes an outstanding casserole, bring casseroles, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'll take a casserole any day. You know, <laughs> my my sister in law is an amazing cook, and uh, she's a, a local teacher, and uh, so she brings me great leftovers, and okay. so and even my neighbors. Yeah. So I'll get food. <laughs> I'm well fed. One of the things too that um is. What I we used to talk about leftovers when my mom was ill, people would say, Can we bring this? Can we bring that? And they had so much food. Yeah. I started saying, If you really just bring an extra two plates of your dinner, right? Just make a little extra for my parents yeah. and drop it at their porch. And in that way, you're not making a separate meal. And I don't have any, I didn't say it, but having to store it somewhere where do you put all these things? And then about time, how do you, how would someone, what's What's the best use of your time? Do you just want someone to come watch a Netflix series with you? Absolutely. What, what does that look yeah. like? Having someone come over and visit, watch a Netflix series. Um, you know, uh, I would say that's probably the best use of time. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have a chronic illness, it's, you know, I talk about your support. You know, you have your family, your friends, and your neighbors, but it's important to find the right doctors. So I have a pain specialist, and he's great. Uh, no one should be living their lives in pain. I mean, there was, there were times where, unfortunately, I thought about suicide mm -hmm. um, because it was just so chronic, and I just couldn't see past it. Yeah. I uh, getting a good therapist helped, and I went to a therapist who actually specializes uh, with young people with chronic conditions. Um, so I was really lucky to, uh, have him as a therapist. And now, uh, so your, excuse me, your everyday life now, um, you know, you, you have a positive attitude and does that come from this supportive family and this total, 
Absolutely. You, have, you, you know, the key thing when you have a chronic illness, there's, there's a few things I would recommend. Adopt a cat or a dog. Mm-hmm. So you're actually yeah. taking care of, of something more than just you. And there are plenty of dogs that would love to be a lap dog uh, that are a senior dog. Um, I, I adopted my Chica. She's 16 and a half years old now. And she's doing great. And um, she's just more than happy to be in my lap. And she gives me so much comfort and love. Um, keep a passion for what you love to do. Now, I this is a disease that you're continually mourning what you lost. You know, I have short-term memory issues. I have long-term memory issues. Um, you know, I could walk into the mailbox is really kind of my uh, uh, chore, you know, that it's difficult, but I do it. Uh, So, uh, yeah, being homebound, you know, it's a lot. I'm on social media a lot, helping with my page, Multiple Sclerosis Unplugged. We have about 10,000 people on there. And it's all spectrums of MS, transverse myelitis, ADE, or uh, neuromyelitis optica. And, um, and the old podcast I used to do, um, is still on blog talk radio under the scrolls that's unplugged and we've had over 70,000 listens. So I am pretty proud about that, but unfortunately due to my illness, uh, continuing, I had a severe, uh, neurological event. And the funny thing was, is I was filling in for Dave Kiefer on the plate and it was last break. And I went on and it was like the stroke hit me. And so when I was talking, it sounded like I was drunk. So people called in to the radio station saying, hey, I think there's something wrong with your DJ. You know, I think she's been drinking a little too much on the job. (laughs) I think just continuing to find passion in your life. If you, my dad's great advice to me is when you can no longer do what you love, find something new to love. And for me, it's art right now. You don't even have to be good at it. I'm doing paint by the numbers, but it's, it's fun. And it's, you know, joining a book club on Zoom. Um, I do that weekly for the Baha'i book club. And I just, you know, you find something new to do. I really commend you for all that uh, you're achieving in the space that you're in. And I, Like I said, I love your positive attitude and the big smile of yours. And I just wish you the best always. Thank you. And just keep up the good work. I really respect the work you're doing in the world. 